Hi, and welcome back. So this is the third video in the series on intermediate Python. So in the previous video, I covered enums. And in this video, I wanted to do something different. So instead of covering a specific data structure or single concept in Python, I want to talk about style in Python and specifically about PEP8. So as you know, there are many ways of writing the same code. Whether you choose to add some spacing here or there, there are many different ways of doing this. In some languages, it's completely up to you how you want to structure it. They just emphasize clarity, essentially. While in other languages, there is a semi-official style guide in the sense of how you should style your code. And Python is one of these languages. So in Python, there's this thing called pep8, which we'll look at in a moment. And this tells you how to style or format your code. I prefer the word format in a sense. Style makes me think of like, which kind of font do you want when you're writing in an editor? That's not what we're talking about. That's of course super important, but this is not what we're talking about today. Today we're talking simply about the formatting of your code. And this will become clear once we take a look at PEP8. So what we'll do in this video is first just take a look together at the PEP8 specification, then we'll jump into Drupal notebooks and fix up some code that is not properly formatted. And then at the end, I'll talk a bit about formatting tools that do this automatically and how they're useful, when they're useful, and when they're not so useful. So I hope you're excited. Let's jump into it. So here we are with the official style guide for Python. This is what's called PEP8. And PEP, as you can see here, stands for Python Enhancement Proposals. So there are plenty of PEPs. You can take a look here at the PEP index. Then very meta-like, you get PEP0, the index of Python Enhancement Proposals. But here you can see kind of a table of contents. Some PEPs are about other PEPs, again, very meta, but also you have other informational PEPs and here you can probably find most of the useful ones for you. So you've probably seen like the son of Python maybe perhaps, or 257 is doc strings convention. And there are loads of these that are kind of useful. So let's go back to the style guide here. So the style guide for Python is the official recommended way to style your code. Before we take a look at this, I do want to mention that there are specific companies that have their own style guide that have essentially minute tweaks to this. Most companies just use PEP8, say to the developers, hey, we're writing Python in PEP8, please follow this. And really, in my own opinion, PEP8 is a good thing, and it has really two use cases. The first is consistency, and the second is to essentially end all these debates about formatting. Because really, when it comes down to it, some of the major things here are super useful, but some of the really minor things, like where you should put spaces, are really not that useful to have lengthy discussions about. It's good that it's just consistently set, like, this is the way you should do it. Of course, it's kind of ironic that I'm talking to you about consistency when you're looking at the screen, and you can see here that a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. And what PEP8 means by this, and I completely agree, is that you should try to be consistent, but you shouldn't be consistent to the point where it actively sabotages your project. So for instance, if you have legacy Python code, you shouldn't go back and update the whole thing to the style guide unless you have a specific reason for doing so. If you have some Python code from an old project five years back, you know that many of the developers didn't really use PEP8 but it's working as intended. It doesn't seem to have any bugs. People are not actively working on it. There's really no good reason to go back and update this code. You shouldn't like force consistency if you don't have a use case for it. The major use case for consistency in practice is that the code becomes easier to read. And yeah, if no one is reading the code, then what's the point, right? You can view it on this site, but I also just like to read it here. So this is a different site. I think it's pep8.org. And this is the exact same information, just stylized a bit nicer, essentially for humans. So here you can see the same thing. I have essentially bookmarked pep8 and I've bookmarked this one. I'll leave a link in the description for both of them. And I use this quite a lot to just make sure that I'm on point with what I'm writing. And all in all, pep8 is really like, let's say roughly an hour to read. So it's not insanely short, but it's not like a Herculean task or something like this to actually read it. So for instance, if I go here and go for instance to imports, then it simply says imports should usually be on separate lines. So you should do import OS, import sys, and not import OS comma sys. For some of the things in pep8, I didn't really know before I read pep8 that this was actually allowed but it is, you just shouldn't use it. So some of the things, if you've been going through good programming books or courses or whatever, you would probably just write it like this anyway, and that's a good sign. 
It says it is okay to say this though. So from some processes import p open and pipe. So you can import specific things like functions and classes from a specific module. And imports are always put at the top of a file just after any module comments and doc strings. And there are specific orderings to them. And there are specific orderings to them. This many people don't really follow that closely, but this is a good standard. First, you should do standard library imports like OS and sys. Then you should do related third party imports like pandas and numpy. Then finally, you should do local applications or library specific imports. And you should put a blank line between each group of imports. And you can of course continue reading the whole thing, but I just wanted to emphasize to you that most of this is actually super readable. It's not some incredibly technical or difficult document to read. It simply lies out, we should probably do it in this way, not in this. And most of it actually makes sense if you think about it. The reason you probably want imports on separate lines is that it's easier to see every one of them. Rather, if you have a long string of like comma, 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 all the way over here, it's a bit harder to parse with your eyes what's actually included. So here's something really specific. There's also some general guidelines. So if you go, for instance, into inline comments, it says, first of all, use inline comments sparingly. So an inline comment is a comment on the same line as a statement. Inline comments should be separated by at least two spaces from the statement. They should start with a hashtag and a single space. So here's the correct formatting, but inline comments are unnecessary and in fact distracting if they state the obvious. So don't say like increment by one or increment X. This is what the code is explaining. You should probably, if you want to write inline comments, then you should explain the motivation for the code. So here is like X equals X plus one. And this says it compensates for the border. Of course, this is completely out of context, but this could be a generally useful comment for someone who's reading the code to see. So the PEP8 is a mixture of really hard rules, like you should do the imports precisely like this. And there are some, let's say, recommendations regarding, for instance, naming conventions and so on. So it's a bit of both. I was actually pondering while making this video if like, should I go through the whole PEP8 with you? Of course, I think this will be rather boring to do it with me, but I really suggest that you should do it on your own. And if you're honest with yourself when you're saying, I don't want to read through the whole thing, then simply just start at the top, read for 10 minutes, you'll probably be well into it. And then when you're coding the next time, you can actually try to pick up some of these and use them in your code. One of the things for me personally, who immediately separates someone who's more of a novice in Python with someone who is into the intermediate ranges and above is that they have good coding style. So enough messing around in the documentation, let's go to a Jupyter Notebook sheet and actually try to implement some of these with some existing code. So here we have a Jupyter Notebook and here we have essentially got some work ahead of us. So here I've written some code and what we're going to do is to take this code and essentially fix it up. I know that I haven't showed you all of PEP8, but I think I can explain along the way what we're doing and which fixes we're trying to do. So just to very quickly explain the code because it's not really difficult, it makes a NumPy array essentially of prime numbers and it has one function called add one, which creates a new matrix, loops through the rows and columns of the previous matrix and adds one and then returns it. So it does essentially add one. The second function is called extract column and it returns the first column of a matrix as a pandas series. Here you can see the code and you can see here that we've used add one and extract column on this numpy array of prime numbers and add one simply adds one to all the entries and extract column simply extracts the first column. We're going to fix up this code at least as much as possible so that it complies with PEP8. And you might have noticed also before we get started that there is some kind of mistake into this whole thing. The problem here is that when you call this extract column, then I get three, eight and 18. Wait, that's not my original numbers. That was two, seven and 17. And that's because essentially the first function has already modified the matrix. Not very great. We'll get to this, but first we'll start from the top and just essentially try to fix up everything. First of all, we have some imports. We're not supposed to do imports on the same line. So we should import them separately. Also, there are some typical conventions with these libraries. You don't need to use them, but it's typically very well received if you do. Alias them, numpy as np and pandas as pd. So let's take np here and let's take pandas. I think the only place is here. We'll see when we get through it. So we start here by making a numpy array. The code works. The first thing I see is that this is very unsymmetric. It's like no space here, but one space here. It should be spaced on both sides. Also here, we don't need this kind of useless spaces here. There should be a space after commas like this. Here's two spaces. I think this looks good. 
So here you actually have quite a few options. So this is one way to do it. You can also do things like this, and you can also do something like this. This definitely takes a lot more space, but it's also quite a lot more readable in my opinion. I can easily see that this is a three by three matrix now. So I think I'll leave it for this. The previous way I had it was also completely fine. Finally for this, the name NP array kind of sucks to be honest. This is a matrix of prime numbers. I think I'll just call it prime numbers. This is used here and here. Good, let's continue on. Now we make a function, we call it add one, but the default naming style in Python is to use snake case. This is writing things in lowercase letters and then using an underscore. So this should at least be add one. Add one is maybe not such an awful name, it's at least very short. We could do increment matrix by one. This is again a bit more lengthy, but maybe a bit more clear. I think I'll stick to this one, entering a matrix. And here is a lot going on. Here we're trying to set a one by one matrix with the element zero as a default value. So first of all, this is something that I see quite a lot. When you assign a variable, it should be space on both sides. But actually when you set default values and functions, this should not be the case. It should be just like this. And now we've strictly speaking fixed it. I want to get back to this in a while because there are other problems with what I've done here. Here should be no space before the colon. Here we have a doc string. This function adds one to a matrix. So first of all, doc strings should be written with double quotes. So typically in Python, you have a lot of flexibility whether you want to use single quotes or double quotes, not for doc strings. They should have double quotes and three on each side. Starting with this function is a bit redundant. So let's just do adds one to a matrix. And since I've changed the whole thing to the increment, maybe I'll actually go and do increments a matrix by one. And here we have all of this code and let's just stick it for now. New matrix, have this thing here, it looks kind of okay. Here we loop through the number of rows by doing matrix.shape and zero. We don't need the spaces. And then you loop through the columns. We don't need a space. And then you do this thing here. Before we change the logic of the code, maybe let's just look here. So here we have an inline comment. Okay, sounds good. But it should be a space here. It should start as a complete sentence with a capital letter. Now it looks syntactically nice, but it's also kind of pointless. This is the thing the documentation talked about. You shouldn't use inline comments simply to specify what is happening. Here I say adds one to each entry in the matrix. Okay, that's great, but that's exactly what's written here in code. I don't really need this. So honestly, I'll just remove it. Also standalone functions should have two spaces between them. So it should be something like this. Now I think this function here is fine from a pep8 standpoint. I think we should address the kind of obvious things here, namely that I don't need this whole thing. I can just do this. This is a NumPy specific thing. If I take a matrix and add a scalar value like one, it simply broadcasts that value to all the entries. This does exactly the same, only faster. The second problem is that you should not do mutable things as default arguments like this. One way to solve this would be to pass in a tuple containing the value zero and then check for it in the code. But I think in this case, we don't really need it. So I will just have it as this. I mean, definitely the code looks better now. Now we have the second function. This is the extract column. Here the naming convention is good, but I think when you read a doc string, this function returns the first column. I think we should also include that in the name. Here we have a matrix. Here again, should be double quotes like this. This function returns, again, I don't need this function. So it returns the first column of a matrix as a pandas series. So it returns pd.dataframe of the first row. So there are some spacing mistakes here, but instead of doing this in one line, I think I'll actually do a separate variable, getting the first row, extracting that here. I don't need the space here. Hi, I like from the future here. So of course this should be first column, not first row. So this is a great advocacy for pull requests because typically to get great quality, you always need more than one person to look through the code. Okay, back to the video. Essentially, if you think about commas, they work in the same way as in commas in usual sentences. You should not have a space before and you should have a space after. And now we return the data frame version of this. Here, I think I want these on different lines. Generally having many statements on the same line can be a bit confusing. And of course I need to switch out the names. Look at this. 
here we have the same functional code, except that this problem of mutability has gone away. Now the code actually works as it should. And come on, if you look at this code compared to the original one, you can just go back in the video. This looks a lot better, right? Some of it is definitely due to cleaning up the logic that was flawed, but also some of it is really just due to, it looks very symmetric, it looks very nice. It's very easy to read. So if you go back here now, import numpy as mp, import pandas as pd, we create prime numbers as an mp array. Okay, so it's the first prime numbers. I think this should be like this, good. And then you increment matrix by one and then return matrix plus one. You extract first column and it returns the first column of matrix. And then we apply the functions. So you can see here how much easier it is to actually read the code. Again, the code here is super artificial. I just made some functions to be able to essentially show you how to do this. I think the principle still stands that cleaning up your code is a super useful thing. And also not only cleaning up the logic as we did in this function here, but also cleaning up the way it looks. So a final thing I wanted to show you is that there are code formatters. So what we did with cleaning up some of the code, much of this can be automated. So there are many of these, I just wanted to show you one of them. This is black. It's the uncompromising code formatter. And the kind of slogan is any color you like. I think this is a play on Ford cars where allegedly they said you can have any color as you like as long as it's black. Of course, the joke here from the black formatter side is that they're uncompromising in the sense that they determine some of these details, some of this flexibility, so that you don't have to worry about them. It's annoying to use these kind of tools in Jupyter Notebooks, but when you're writing code for production in, say, a code editor, then these are super, super useful. I actually really recommend Black, but I also want to get the other point across that some of the things that we did, Black won't really do. So let's just take a quick look at our code again. So Black will fix many things. For instance, if I run Black and mess up something like this, then yeah, it'll pick it up. I definitely run Black or another formatter after I've finished with my code, it's super useful, but you shouldn't overestimate them as well. For instance, if you make bad variable names, they will not fix it. They'll leave all your variable names as they are, because you know, if the code formatter would change your variable names, that would be awful, so they can't do that. So they can't really enforce that you name things, for instance, in snake case, as you should. They can't enforce that you write prime numbers instead of ND array, which is a horrible name. They can't fix up your logic like we did here. There are lots of things in your code that code formatters won't really do. So in my view, you use code formatters for the stupid stuff, essentially this, and then you essentially have to go through the code yourself and do the important stuff. The important stuff being checking that the logic is actually working, first of all, as intended, but that it is written in a good way, checking that you have descriptive doc strings and so on and so on. All the important stuff you actually have to do yourself. This is life. I hope this kind of motivated you to go into PEP 8 and just try to look at some of it. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, I'll see you again in the next video in the series. Thanks and have a nice day.